without a doubt. They railroaded me, ran me over, arrested, tried. It could be anyone. And convicted. 80% of my adult life was in there. But what happens when the justice system gets it wrong? The need is exponential. And innocent people spend decades in prison. I didn't do it. Tonight, the News 5 investigators go behind bars to show people fighting for their freedom swallowed by the system. Last year was a record year for exonerations. More people than ever before winning their freedom, released from prison, and rejoining society. Hello, I'm Rob Powers. Ohio has the seventh most people exonerated in the country, the majority from right here in Northeast Ohio. And that's why we dedicate this next half hour to their struggle. We begin with investigator Scott Knoll, who spent more than one year chronicling the story of Dwayne Brooks. Locked away behind the razor fences that break up the surrounding farm fields of Grafton. No one is believing. Dwayne Brooks wondered, was anyone listening? I was screaming into the wind for all of these years. Insisting for three and a half decades, he wasn't what the state said he was. A murderer. It's terrible, man. It's, it's, it's one of the worst things you could, you could carry around in life. No. No way. Aisha Robertson never believed it. He was always that father figure. He might have been more of the father figure than my own father. She was just 10 years old the night police barged into the family's Shaker Heights home. I was awakened at about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning in my bedroom by a SWAT team, full gear, red beams all over my bedroom. Those police searching for her brother, the arrest warrant, for murder. That was one of the hardest things to even imagine. Police say it all started at Luke Easter Park. A fight in August 1987. Someone gets beaten and robbed. Days later, a shooting. Three people shot. Clinton Arnold died. Police call it revenge. Say Dwayne Brooks was one of the shooters. What happened? Luke Easter Park, August 17th, 1987. I don't know. To this day, I don't know. How do you not know? Because I wasn't there. Brooks insists he wasn't even in Cleveland that day. He says he was in New York, on Long Island. Had been for two days. A jury didn't buy it. Brooks sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. When I first got to prison, they slammed that door behind me. I laid on that, on that bunk and I cried. I cried. But I still thought that, you know, within some months, whether it was three or six months or even a year, that this conviction would be overturned. But reversing a conviction isn't easy. Years of appeals grew into decades. Then the discovery. I knew it was big, and I knew it was everything that I had been telling people all of those years. They were police reports from the murder. Revelations Brooks had never seen that a witness put two other men in the van used in the deadly shooting, and that the man who testified Brooks was the shooter was himself under FBI investigation. Brooks' attorney says he never saw those police reports before trial. It was exculpatory and very useful to the defense. The lead prosecutor on Brooks' case says in 1988, the policy was police reports were not handed over to defense attorneys. Is a defendant going to trial with the deck stacked against him without access to these reports? Oh, absolutely. Michael absolutely. Benza is a senior law instructor at Case Western Reserve University. While the prosecutor's policy has since changed, Benza believes right now innocent people sit in prison because of it. It is unfortunately a probably fairly common denominator among, among exonerations. But would it be enough to overturn Brooks' conviction? Do you believe you got run over by the wheels of justice? Without a doubt. They railroaded me, ran me over, sent me up the river, all the terms. I, I, I can relate to him now. His life, his life means something. 
Robertson, hopeful she'll finally get the chance to see her brother walk the streets a free man. Out of the prisons, he spent nearly two-thirds of his life locked in. A prisoner, she believes, of a system more concerned with getting a conviction than getting it right. How do we have any hope in a justice system? If it could be him, it could be me, it could be my son, it could be anyone. Swallowed by the system. Just how many people sit in Ohio prisons wrongfully convicted? One legal expert warns, we may never know. Unfortunately, the vast majority of people who are sentenced to prison do not have lawyers and do not have resources to do that kind of work. Up next, an inside look at the difficult choices to determine which cases get re-examined. You see the headlines. For every one of these people who get exonerated, experts say there are many more who are locked away for crimes they didn't commit. News 5 investigator Tara Morgan takes us inside the difficult process to show how cases are selected for review. A murder in 1974 put Isaiah Andrews on what seemed an insurmountable path. My life is mostly gone with my help. The killing of his wife, Regina. Her body found with 11 stab wounds in Forest Hill Park, a crime Isaiah didn't commit. We have people that are in prison that don't belong there, and for me, there's no greater injustice. Laura Gregg's mission is to help people like Isaiah at the new wrongful conviction clinic at Cleveland State University. The need is exponential. We have far more claims than we have attorneys working in this space. Already, demand is high from inmates, their families, and attorneys. Six students will help re-examine cases. We've had a Almost 40 people um, referred or writing in to us asking for assistance, and we haven't even really opened our doors yet. Complex cases may take years, and there may be some without a valid legal way to see them through. You have to just see if you can find new evidence. That's sort of the crux of the issue. In Isaiah's case, his attorneys uncovered police reports showing another suspect. He was acquitted in his wife's murder in a retrial. So there will be some difficult choices. Absolutely, there's always a difficult choice. And unfortunately, the way that the law is structured, there's just, uh, there's only so much that we can do to help. Joseph Allen and Nancy Smith spent years in prison after a 1994 conviction. The pair was accused of sexually abusing preschoolers in Lorain County. Can you imagine having that hang over you for 28 years? Nobody knows what that was like. A judge threw out the charges when new evidence surfaced about false allegations. They are While success stories make the headlines, sometimes years are spent helping inmates who were guilty all along. Did you rape Phyllis Cottle? No, I did not. Samuel Herring spent nearly 40 years saying he wasn't the guy, but new tests found his DNA on Phyllis Cottle's clothing, proving Herring did rape her in 1984. Clearly, Samuel Herring knew he was not innocent. He went to the Innocence Project, convinced them uh, to pursue this, and then came to us. It's ludicrous to think we can know or anybody can know before you do it. That's why you do the testing. Mark Godsey with the Ohio Innocence Project says he gets three to 400 referrals each year. He's been at it for 20 years. I think we've had over like 12,000 people write to us since we started, and we've gone to court in that posture maybe 50 times, and we've won most of them. As a prosecutor, the last thing we want is for somebody innocent to be sitting in prison, especially even worse for many years. It was 46 years for Isaiah. Last March, a judge declared Isaiah wrongfully in prison. The only thing I didn't want to do was die. Without having no justice. Isaiah died one month later. He was 83, but in his fight for justice, he had one message for those on the same path toward freedom. Hey, you know, man, fight. Because that's the only way you're going to win. Just last month, a year after he died, the courts approved a $3 million settlement in Isaiah's wrongful imprisonment case. $3 million is a lot of money. So, where does all that money go? Well, sadly, we're told that he has no surviving siblings, so some of that will go to distant relatives out of state. Tara, why so many wrongful convictions in the first place? 
A number of things, witnesses who misidentify someone, false confessions, police misconduct, bad science, and defense lawyers who didn't do a good job. Mm. Tara, thank you. Still ahead, a break in the Dwayne Brooks case. I want to hug my mother and hold her, pick her up and just hold her in my arms. If she wants to cry, she can cry. If I want to cry, I can cry. That's what I want to do first. It's like something out of a nightmare. I heard a knock at the door, I opened the door, and they arrested me. Charged with murder, taken from his family, from his home, for a crime Dwayne Brooks says he had nothing to do with. There was no evidence. They took me to trial for murder. Facing the death penalty with no evidence. In Ohio, in America. For 35 years, Dwayne Brooks sat behind bars, insisting he's innocent of the 1987 murder of Clinton Arnold in Cleveland's Luke Easter Park. How could you just put a murder on somebody that didn't do it? How does that happen? Then, a break in Brooks' case. Police reports never turned over to defense attorneys raised questions about his guilt. In April, Cuyahoga County Judge William McGinty ruled what was hidden for decades in those reports cost Brooks a fair trial. The guilty verdict overturned. This is the last of it all, Now 57 years old, Brooks walked out of jail and into the arms of family. For more than three decades, his mother wondered if this day would ever come. Well, no, we spent a long time coming. It's been rough, it's been rough, it's been rough. But uh, thank God, we got him. We got him, and he's free at last. He's free. But as the tears flowed, so did another painful reality, the years lost. Time Brooks' daughter, Danae, says she can never get back. She was four years old when her dad was arrested. They didn't give him a chance to be a dad to us. They don't know how many father-daughter dances I've been to without him. They don't know in the past year fighting cancer without him. Like, this is unreal, it's overwhelming, and we got a lot of lost time to make up for. And for Brooks, another sign someone was finally listening to what he'd been saying for years. And I know some people would rather believe a lie than, than accept the truth, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I told everybody from day one that I didn't do it. And here we are, finally, 35 years later. Wow. So what was it like, Scott, to see him behind bars and then again as a free man? Rob, it really was emotional to see him go from being so isolated to then surrounded by friends, family, supporters, people who never stopped believing Dwayne Brooks when he said he was innocent, all there to see him move one step closer to proving it. Still, 35 years is such a long time. It is. In fact, this may have been one of the most eye-opening moments and really put the whole thing in perspective. Dwayne Brooks walks out, somebody hands him a cell phone. Remember, 35 years ago, iPhone wasn't even invented yet. The world that Dwayne Brooks stepped into, much different from the world he was in back in the 1980s. Well, Scott, thank you. Dwayne Brooks has a support system, but as another exoneree told us, there is no formal support from the system which wrongfully convicted them in the first place. And that lack of support can often be a sentence of its own. 1989, 26-year-old Joe D'Ambrosio sentenced to death in the shortest death penalty trial in Ohio history. Two and three quarter days from let's start to you die. Joe spent 22 years on death row for a murder he did not commit. 80% of my adult life was in there. 14 years ago, after two full decades of proclaiming his innocence, came these words in a packed courtroom. She said, Mr. D'Ambrosio, you are free. Those words, you know, Mr. D'Ambrosio, you are free. They were a long time in the making. Father Neil Kakuthi met Joe during his time on death row. The priest, along with Joe's lawyers, spent that decade working to clear Joe's name. What really freed Joe was the evidence. And get his life back. Joe is not your typical exoneree from death row. He is not. He had support and a job waiting for him at Father Neal's church. Our staff here at St. Clarence once had five maintenance guys on it. And as those people left, I did not fill the positions because I knew Joe was coming out. I'm blessed 
I truly am. I had a place to live. I had work. I had people to support me. The support that had come to him uh, is not typical of what many people experience when they are exonerated, either from general population or for death row. There is absolutely nothing in place for an exoneree. Nothing. If you do a crime, get convicted, do your time and get out. There's all kinds of programs and everything in place. For an exoneree, there's nothing. They've got no clothes. They've, often they have no shelter. There's no place to go. They open the door, they kick you out, and they'll be like, well, he'll be back, he'll be back. Because you have to survive. And what can you do to survive if you have nothing? You're gonna do something wrong. And then they're gonna be like, see, we told you he was back. Since his exoneration, Joe has been able to rebuild his life, even thrive, something he knows he could not have done without the support of people like Father Neil. He was God sent, truly. But I also had not only his support, but his whole parish's support. And I have never felt more unconditional love than I ever have from that parish. It's one thing to get out, another to clear your name. The final chapter in Dwayne Brooks' story, next. All right. So uh, we're on the record here. Out of prison, but still not fully free. In case number. In April, a judge overturned the guilty verdict against Wayne Brooks, finding he didn't receive a fair trial, but the door was still open. Would prosecutors retry Brooks for the 1987 murder that landed him behind bars for three and a half decades? In the eyes of people that don't know me, that stigma is still gonna be attached to me. Finally, in September, in the same courthouse where he became a convicted killer, Brooks' name cleared. The charges dropped. The fact that any person is held in jail for one day, let alone 12,729 days, shocks the conscience. I have to say that the law is not perfect, as evidenced by Duane's incarceration. Judge William McGinty handing Brooks the paperwork, dismissing the murder charges against him. Tears, tears and hugs in the courtroom. So many emotions, best summed up in one word. Relief. Like I told you before, this isn't justice for me, but it's a symbol of justice on paper that I thought these courts wasn't capable of. But Brooks says what he can't get back is the time. He spent nearly two thirds of his life locked away for a murder he says he didn't commit. Walking out of court and past the jail where he was once caged, the 57-year-old raised a fist in the air, a symbol to those still fighting for their freedom. And I'm Dwayne Brooks, but, and there's nobody like me, but there are others who've been wrongfully convicted and it's just, it just needs to stop. It has to, it has to halt. Tara Morgan and Scott Knoll. I'm Rob Powers. Thanks for being with us.